Uh, now, uh, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Lord Robert May, who is a systems biologist. He was former president of the Royal Society, chief scientific advisor to the UK government and head of its Office of Science and Technology. He's uh, had a very distinguished career, ranging from a personal chair in theoretical physics at Sydney, chair of zoology at Princeton, Royal Society professorships at, at Oxford Imperial College. He has a mass of world's top prizes, and it's a pleasure to welcome Bob, who will speak to us on cooperation among nations in a crowded world. Yes, I first of all have to establish whether I can make this uh, understand. Yes. Um, those of you who heard the talk I gave last night at the dinner will recall I said Darwin in his time had three problems. The, Seeing as we knew nothing about nuclear forces, the sun couldn't have been burning long enough for the time that geology needed. Secondly, the way current ideas about inheritance in his time, blending wouldn't maintain the variability we actually see. And thirdly, the problem of how you evolve altruistic cooperative associations um, seemed to him a difficult problem. And we've solved the first two, uh, but we haven't got beyond that to a significant degree. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about evolution of cooperation and where we are and some of the problems in relation specifically to Brian Hoskin's talk on climate change, although the implications go wider. I want to pause before I do so to say a little bit more about the second problem. If you've got a bunch of genes in the parents, under blending inheritance, things get blended each generation and you rapidly wash out the variability. What Mendel showed is under particulate inheritance, that doesn't happen. And it's a kind of Newton's first law of evolutionary biology. Newton's first law says something really very counterintuitive on everyday experience. It says bodies tend to remain in their state of rest or uniform motion unless there are external forces. Hardy Weinberg says gene frequencies don't change if there aren't things happening. Newton's second law says if there are forces, then the rate of change of position, acceleration, is force per unit mass. And there's an interesting theorem I'm going to come back to in a minute called Fisher's Fundamental Theorem, which is the sort of Newton's second law of evolutionary biology. It says rate of change of gene frequency is proportional to how much variability you have. And it poses an interesting and not fully resolved conundrum because it says in evolution there is at any one time and place a tension between being adaptable to change, which requires a lot of variability in the gene pool, and being adapted, which if the world were not going to change would mean after time you'd be moving to get a bunch of the best adapted. There's an inherent tension between adaptedness and adaptability. So what's that got to do with climate change? Brian gave you a very good account, and I'm just going to summarize it in a couple of seconds by saying, here is an unprecedented statement by the World Science Academy, the science academies of the G8 countries, along with China, India, Brazil, that says climate change is real, it's primarily human associated, and it's really serious. Nick Stern's report that says, actually, if we don't do anything about it by the middle of the century, the cost is going to be something like 5 to 20% of GDP, global GDP. Whereas the cost of action, best estimate, may be about 1% loss of GDP. And of course, the problems fall very inequitably. So what we need to do is get together, as Brian said, and cooperate to address this. But here we run into the central problem of evolutionary biology. Small groups, groups of relatives, groups with rather kinky um, genetic uh, things, haplodiploids, 
you can see how cooperative, asso seemingly altruistic associations make sense in terms of selfish genes. But more generally, if you look at uh, a community of people and what we're doing at the moment, there's a huge and expanding literature in which people evoke metaphors. If you're an ecologist, it's the tragedy of the commons. If you're an economist, it's the free rider problem. If you're an evolutionary biologist, it's the prisoner's dilemma. And for those not familiar with it, it's a game. Here's a two-person game. In each round, you can choose to cooperate or defect. If I cooperate and you cooperate, we get four units. But if you cooperate and I cheat, I defect, I do better, I get five units. Conversely, if I cooperate and you cheat, I get nothing. If we both cheat, we get one. It doesn't matter what you do, I'm better off cheating. You think the same and we get locked into mutual defection. It's not a trick, there's no, it's, not a, it's a paradox. There's not a trick, there's not a trick answer. There's a huge literature, experiments where people, Harvard has a laboratory in the business school where undergraduates can sign up to play these games of, uh, as it were, generalized repeated trials, dilemma, and they play for small sums, and frankly, I don't trust any of the answers because they, I think they're more keyed on wanting uh, little narrow win definitions rather than cooperative outcomes, uh, but no research council is going to give you enough money to have people play it for a sum that really matters, which is what we're doing with the planet. Perhaps the most interesting of these are games in which the peop many people are playing, you see what the players did, One form of it is you've each got a sum of money and there are ten rounds and you each put some of the money in and if you get over a threshold then you'll all keep the money you didn't put in. And what always happens is, if you think against cricket, there's a run rate at which you should be putting money in to get to the threshold. At the beginning everybody puts a little bit too little hoping the others will be doing fair shares. Then they realize it's not going well and they begin to catch up and toward the end they all put all their money in to try and meet the hurdle and more than half the times they don't and they all lose all their money. One of the most disturbing versions of this game is a comparison among different countries where you can choose to punish people. You pay a small penalty to punish somebody who cheated. Different countries. Scandinavian countries tend fairly rapidly to lock into patterns of cooperation. Certain other countries, the people who are punished, instead of thinking, well, maybe I'll cooperate, just get pissed off and punish the punisher. And actually, Saudi Arabia, this worse down the bottom, which gets locked into a totally lunatic thing of mutual punishment, everybody punishing everybody, saying, how dare you offend me. I hope I, we do not understand this very well. What I think is and we got to large, complex, cooperative associations and I think we've done it in large part, and there is again a literature on this, by inventing a supernatural entity to do the punishing. I refer, of course, to organized religion. It has many beneficial effects. It creates high, orderly hierarchies who interpret the wishes of, define the norms, and it makes, not always equitably, but it makes, it permits ties that bind. Coming back to what I said at the beginning, however, if that is the explanation, it's also bad news. Because if that is the explanation of the kinds of mechanisms we arrive at to have societies that cohere, 
Those are mechanisms that are going to be rather like, have elements of Fisher's fundamental theorem. They're going to be things that are quite good as long as things are going well, but such hierarchies as we observe today with the rise of more fundamental shapes in religions that had softened over the generations, they're going to be resistant to change. And you're going to have, I conjecture, a kind of Fisher's fundamental theorem in this cooperative aggregate of the tension between the mechanisms that adapted us to the circumstances of the past, but which are resistant to change. And to repeat myself, I see the rise of fundamentalism both in East and in the West as, this, as a reaction to the changes we need. Furthermore, we need not only to cooperate, but to cooperate in equitable proportions. And Brian Hoskins explained to you, we need to be coming down to a level of carbon input that across the world would amount to an average of 50% reduction, but that means in Britain, and that's why we set our targets, an 80% reduction. It means we're coming down to it and we're al allowing for China and India to move up to it, though more slowly than they're heading. You've always got to keep that in mind. When you hear that someone in the Americans are thinking of maybe doing 80%, that means they're only doing half as much as us, of course, they're starting from being twice as bad. Huge inequities. My penultimate slide. This is not some touchy-feely, greeny slide. This is a UK Ministry of Defence slide. And it plots areas of notable tension for water scarcity, Rapid population growth, crop decline, hunger, coastal risk. And on that it superimposes in the appropriately violent asterisk things areas of reach, recent conflict. It's an interesting documentation that it's not just rhetoric to say that we are already seeing the incivilities that the problems of too many people and too much impact per person are putting on the land. And I end by referring to this wonderful book of Jared Diamond's, where Jared Diamond's asked himself of a mini experiment that we're now doing with the globe as a whole on Easter Island. So the Melanesians arrived on Easter Island, happily settled, many different villages, each with their own tribal gods, seemingly in harmonious coexistence of the different, as it were, religious sects. They cut down all the trees, fishing-based economy, and in the final stages, you see intersign warfare, the statues pulled down, and Jared wonders, what did they say as they cut down the final trees? Did they say it's Jobs, not trees? <laughs> Did they say, we need more research? <laughs> more likely, they got locked into, I will if you will, giving way to I won't if you won't. And it's not a comfortable reflection. I would like to end on a more upbeat note but I would think, uh, to borrow from uh, Johnson on, ma on second marriage, um, it would be a triumph of hope over expectations.